Welcome back. As we promised, we are going to continue covering the latest developments in Gaza and particularly the truce which entered its fourth and final day and uh, it allowed uh, the uh, uh, flock of uh, humanitarian aid into Gaza and um, stopping the bloodshed at least for a while with the uh, Egyptian Qatari and American mediating efforts to shed more light on the truth on the latest developments. We are very much delighted to have uh, with us uh, over the phone uh, Mr. Dr. Milad Mumtaz, our political analyst. A very good morning to you, Dr. Milad. Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Good morning, sir. Sir, um, before going into the details, how do you see the continuous contacts by Egypt to reach the truth and the contacts also to follow up on its implementation on the ground? Actually, you know, Egypt has been playing a very active role since the beginning of the conflict. And I believe even in the last 10 years, we would see it very clearly that Egypt intervened in the five confrontation between Hamas and Israel. In this very recent conflict of the war between Hamas and Israel, okay, I believe among the three mediators, United States of America, Qatar, and Egypt, I think Egypt has been playing, I wouldn't say the most active, but actually the one of the most important roles in striking this agreement. Why? First, Egypt is very close to both parties. With, the, with Israel, it's, we've been in contact with Israel since day one. And we have been actually talking to them directly. And with Hamas, the same thing. And I would like actually to say that the truth or the humanitarian pose that we are on the fourth day of this truth, okay, it's been very hard to reach. It's been stages. It went in a stageal form. And Egypt has been there in the three stages and even in the implementation. We've seen that in the different stages of the, okay, reaching that agreement, Egypt was there. Egypt has been trying or was trying actually to reach the agreement in different ways, especially when it comes to the number of hostages being released or the prisoners on the side of Israel. It went in three stages, as I said. Okay, even when reaching the very final stage of the truth of the agreement, it was very difficult to be concluded. And actually, the two parties to get to agree on this, and Egypt interfered. In addition, you know, for America and Qatar, of course, to reach that agreement. The implementation itself, Egypt has been part and parcel, a very important, playing a very important role in this actually implementation of the agreement. We've seen that, okay, uh, when it comes to the Egyptian security delegation receiving the hostages from Israel at the, the uh, Rafah crossing and then delivering those hostages to the other side, which over the Israeli authorities, Egypt has been there and the security delegation has been playing a very active role in this. On the other hand, which I find it very crucial, and it shows that Egypt has been playing different roles parallelly, which is the humanitarian aid getting into Gaza. Egypt has been calling for this since day one. And now we're seeing that 200 lorries getting into Gaza on a daily basis. I know that the number of lorries or trucks getting into Gaza is not enough by all means. However, Okay, this number is highly needed, desperately needed, I would say, not only highly needed, because the people have been suffering for the last 50 days in Gaza. Unprecedented Another, suffering, yes. sir, with their, uh, with their homes demolished, no electricity, no water, no food, no um, uh, medicines, nothing. But, sir, um, since you have mentioned the efforts exerted by Egypt and on all levels, whether it's a strategic role to be accurate politically uh, uh, on the humanitarian level, and also even the Egyptians, the volunteers, the donations, and uh, we are receiving even aid coming from all over the world to enter Gaza from our crossing, from our Rafah site. But you also, um, it's, it's, um, it was very clear that American President Joe Biden himself um, uh, um, Spanish Prime Minister Sanchez, the Belgian Prime Minister, the top diplomats of Portugal and Slovenia, they are all thanking Egypt for their mediation efforts. But where is the role of you as Western leaders? What is the, um, uh, the role of the international community in this period of time? How uh, they can um, pressure Israel at least to extend the truce? How do you see this and what's that role? Okay, first of all, I'd like to highlight something which is very crucial and everyone knows about it, that the international community, as you said, you know, 
failing the entire situation. We've been waiting for the international community to intervene and do something that is really crucial to, to, to stop the bloodshed. Okay, however, however, I believe that, okay, the international community, it's time now, because as you said as well, that President Biden thanked Egypt, not only President Biden, I think most leaders in the world have been praising Egypt for actually the very active role and the very active involvement. However, back to the, your question, you know, where is the international community? The international community has to take an active step to extend the truth. The truth actually has shown that we are in desperate need for this. Namely, if you don't mind, namely the Palestinian people. I know that, okay, civilians should be out of this conflict by own means. However, Palestinian people, especially in the northern regions of Gaza, we need to know that we have 400,000 people still living there in the northern regions of Gaza, despite the fact that they have been extensively warned to move southwardly to the southern region of Gaza, but we still have tens of thousands, I would say hundreds of thousands of them still in the northern regions. So those people need to be protected, need to, need to be fed, need to be provided the, the medical supplies. So where is the international community? That is the question. I would say very clearly that the Security Council should take active steps, active measures, not this to was be divided my coming the way question, that we have sir, seen. Since you mentioned the UN Security Council because a meeting is going to take place in just uh, um, hours from now or exactly uh, less than two days on Tuesday. And um, uh, Foreign Minister Sami Shukri is now in Barcelona to participate in one of the important summits. And after that, he is going to head to New York to participate in this meeting um, um, at the UN Security Council is going to uh, hold a session particularly to um, uh, to uh, discuss the latest development in Gaza. What should be the agenda? And how, um, how we can, uh, what's our homework as, of course, the ministerial meeting, which uh, uh, was the outcome or one of the outcomes of uh, the uh, Riyadh uh, Islamic Arab Summit, which took place uh, earlier. And it ended with the formation of this, um, of this ministerial committee, including the top diplomats of Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, Indonesia, Turkey, a number of Arab and Islamic world uh, states. Okay, actually the summit, the extraordinary summit of the Arab and Islamic countries, we all know that the proclamation or the 31 terms have been acknowledged there uh, in the statement. They need to be implemented. They need to be put into play, not only as in words or ink on paper, as we say. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing for now. The Arab world, the Arab countries, the Muslim countries all over the world, Okay, and every other country involved in this wanting to save the Palestinian people, they need to take active steps, as I said earlier. Active steps like what? Because you mentioned a word that I would like actually to explain a little bit about it, the word agenda. What is the word agenda means for now? The word agenda, I believe, first of all, I think the first priority for now is to reach a permanent ceasefire. A permanent ceasefire is an urgent need now for the entire world not only something that would go for last four days and then it stops and we go back to square number one and they start the heavy bombardment of the different areas of, of Gaza. Because I believe that Gaza has been already, you know, so many areas, as you said as well, has been demolished. So many areas have been gone now, no more. So what we need, first thing, first priority, is to stop the fighting as soon as possible. A ceasefire is not a demand, it's a need. It's an urgent need Urgency. now for the entire yes. world. Mm. Sir, secondly, uh, yes. Yeah. No, go ahead, sir. Uh, secondly, it's the humanitarian aid, as you said. 200 lorries, okay, on a daily basis or trucks on a daily basis entering Gaza, that's not enough by all means. What we know from the previous statistics that 500 trucks is the minimum, not 200 trucks. How about fuel to run the hospitals? How about okay, medical supplies? As we said, 200, that's not enough. Hoping, I'm hoping that the next step to be made is to extend the truth and then we allow more trucks into Gaza to be actually enough to, to feed the people, to provide them okay, everything that they would need in Gaza. 
and then to provide the fuel to run everything, starting the communication and everything else needed for the people in Gaza. Thirdly, which I think the most important, because we're not talking about the conflict that's been going on for 50 days now. I'm talking about the future. What is the future? Not only a, a, a ceasefire for now. I'm talking about, okay, what is the final solution or what could be the final solution to this ongoing conflict that's been there for 75 sir, there years? Unfortunately, there are many Western leaders who do not want even to speak about a future except after reaching a permanent ceasefire and to stop the bloodshed before going into the future plans. But, sir... Uh, let, me, um, let me tackle the importance of the public opinion in Western countries. I mean, it's now that easy to find that there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people protesting in the streets of uh, Madrid, Berlin, London, uh, Paris, you name it. So, uh, Pedro Sanchez, for example, the Spanish Prime Minister said that the killing of the Palestinian civilians is unacceptable by any means. And because of that, Israel recalled its ambassador from Madrid to, uh, to uh, in objection of what was said, even the word unacceptable was not uh, uh, that uh, was not uh, um, that much uh, clear in front of the whole world. I don't know. How do you see um, the importance of uh, this public anger, if I may call it this way, to press not only Israel but to press their governments, their political leaderships, to press Israel? Um, as, uh, as a result. How do you see this equation? I believe, I'm not being exaggerating in this, but I believe for the first time in history, in the 75 years, we see the Western public opinion, the tide is turning against Israel, which is very crucial. Mm -hmm. And this, I believe, that's for the first time happening in the world. We see demonstration, as you said, sweeping squares in most capitals in the world including London, and we have seen what's going on in London in the last five or six weeks. I think the public opinion in the West has been a very important pressuring point. You know, it's been exerting pressure, ongoing pressure on the Western politicians to change their attitude towards Israel. And that's what we're being seen, for example, in London and the Prime Minister, Minister Rishi Sunak. Uh, at the start of the conflict, who is very much with Israel against Palestinians. Now the tone has changed, and now we see more moderate way of describing the situation and seeing the situation. And now Richard Sunak is talking about the, the future, as we were talking about, not only but siding this with Rishi Israel. Sunak, if you permit me to interrupt here, fired one of the uh, ministers in his cabinet because she wrote an article with her own, uh, with what she witnessed herself. I mean, with what we, the whole world. Uh, is witnessing on the screens and uh, with live images from Gaza. He fired her because of what she wrote for being that, um, for showing some mercy, for, so, for showing some sympathy with the, Palestinian, the Palestinians killed inside their own territories and being forced to leave their homes and with their displacement, whether inside their territories or uh, the attempts to display them outside their territories. Totally agree with you. I can't go against this by all means. However, my feeling at what we see as we're following, you know, Western uh, channels, news channels and whatsoever, we would see very clearly that the tide is changing. It's not as it always or has it been always like this for the last 70, 75 years. For the first time, we see news channels, big names in that field of media, changing their attitudes under the pressure from the public opinion in such countries. For example, like in United States of America, I'm not naming some news channels, but it's very obvious, okay, that they have been actually working really hard to make it as balanced as possible. I know this is very challenging to them, the people in the media, okay? I know it's very challenging, but they've been trying to make it kind of, as I said, you know, moderate and balanced at the same time. In a country like Germany, we've seen, you know, even ministers in the cabinet, the German cabinet, talking very bluntly to side with Israel. Now, little by little, things are changing under public pressure, as you said. We are hoping that under the constant public pressure in such Western countries, that their politicians would positively respond to the public pressure, and they would start taking more moderate and just 
attitudes towards Let's it. Let's hope so, people. sir. Let's cross our fingers that tomorrow is going to be a better day and we are not going to lose more innocent lives. Dr. Miled Mumtaz, our political analyst, thank you very much for your input, sir, and have a very good day. Right after the short break, we are going to turn back with more, so stay tuned.